Welcome everyone. Just want to start on time. Respect everybody's time frame. So we're really delighted that you're all here, uh, both our participants and our speakers, joining us for today's AFSI meeting. Theory and Practice, a conversation with Dr. Ron Schleifer and Mr. Esri Tubi. Ron Schleifer is a professor at the Ariel University Center and the founding head of the Ariel Research, Research Center for Defense and Communications. He specializes in the related disciplines of communications, psychological slash information warfare, history of propaganda, and the Middle East. He received his PhD in communications from the University of Leeds in the UK. The Ariel Research Center for Defense and Communications is bringing the issue of psychological warfare slash propaganda to the forefront of the discussion in academic and military circles in Israel and abroad. His latest book, Psychological Warfare in the Arab-Israeli Conflict, was re recently published by Paul Grave Macmillan in New York. We at AFSI are fortunate to have had Dr. Schleifer share his wisdom and insight with us on our Kazuk missions. Ezri Tubi has an illustrious background. After spending his childhood in, in Netanya, he found his heart in the Samaria community of Yitzhak, moved there and found work as a shepherd and became involved with the Hilltop Youth. Ezri soon became the spokesman for the community he loved. In 2014, his eyes were opened to the virtual world with his first Facebook page. He saw the possibilities of reaching millions with the truth about Israel that the mainstream media will not touch. In 2016, he started his organization, Boomerang, Fighting for Israel. He immediately gained international attention with his Imagine video. That and subsequent videos regularly attract at least half a million views. Recently, we learned of his very, very promising campaign to correct the US State Department's biased reporting on Israel via his WhatsApp group, open to all. I'm confident that you're all going to want to sign on to that. AFSI has enjoyed many meetings in Ariel with Esri, the one man Hasbara machine. Thank so we're you. thrilled today to be able to bring you this dynamic pair, uh, really the professor and, and the practitioner. Um, you, you will please enter your questions in the chat box and I hope at the end to get to, get, uh, to, get to as many as possible. Uh, Ron and Esri, again, thank you. Thank you so much for giving your, your time to us today. I have a few questions for discussion. I ask each of you to give a five minute answer to each of my questions. And then I will actually give you a four minute warning so that you know that your, your time, you know, to help you with your timing. Uh, so question number one, and I, I don't know, you can decide between yourselves what, you know, who wants to answer first. What are the historical origins of propaganda? Go for it, Ron. Uh, okay. Um, can you put the uh, slide with the uh, photographs on, on the uh, share screen? Um, of, um, the, yeah, the, the first one. So, never mind. Okay, well, uh, I'll start, and you see. And you see the photographs later on, and uh, um, Jody can uh, can you know uh, send it to you. anybody who's interested. Can send the um, the print PowerPoint. It's a three slide presentation uh, to anyone who's interested. Um, 
Well, I would say that the uh, the forefathers of the uh, of uh, propaganda, I would say the Grand Mufti, the Chief Rabbi, and the Pope of propaganda is Comrade Lenin. He was the first one to uh, to use propaganda on a large scale to um, to use, uh, to start a revolution, um, and he was very successful. Uh, an extremely cynical person, very knowledgeable, very clever, um, with a very clear mind and a political thought, and completely unscrupulous. And uh, this is one thing that they all mo that most of all the people that I have here on the on the screen uh, have in common. Um, which is um, they want, really wanted to win. It doesn't matter what the cost was. Uh, and this is also a lesson that we uh, should consider. Um, the next to uh, Lenin is the guy called uh, Münzenberg, uh, William Münzenberg, uh, a German guy, a communist. Uh, and he is the one who started in the early 20s, uh, the spread of international communism in the West. Uh, we suffered the consequences of his uh, action to this day. Uh, he started the, uh, the thing that um, the academic, uh, mostly social sciences and the humanities and the, uh, and the art people are the um, the pillars of wisdom that we should turn to. Uh, and, and of course, they all come from the left-wing background. Uh, so uh, the, the, put the left in fashion, and that's his, uh, that's William Mitzenberger uh, uh, work. Uh, and of course, he elaborated the system of front organizations, um, the useful idiots, uh, all the, uh, the, car the techniques that the Soviets uh, were, the Bolsheviks were so uh, good with. Um, up on the top right, you can see um, General uh, Giap. Uh, he's the one you don't recognize because the, the one who, sit, who stands next to him is somebody you do recognize. This is the young Yasser Arafat who came in the late 60s to learn how um, how you can oops, how you can win against um, against a superpower, and this is this guy who drove the United the United States from Vietnam. Uh, if I could sum his doctrine in one quick phrase, he's the one who said that the war, the real war in Vietnam, is uh, for the freedom of Vietnam is not run in the jungles of Vietnam, rather in the streets of Washington. This, we should pay attention to that. And uh, underneath uh, uh, these guys uh, is Saul Alinsky, a social worker. Uh, I've noticed David Bedin uh, in the audience, uh, he could uh, uh, tell us a lot of Saul Alinsky, uh, but maybe it's, uh, it's, it's on a special session devoted to them because, because to him, uh, de uh, dedicated uh, to Alinsky, because he is the one uh, behind what you perceive and see nowadays with Antifa and uh, BLM and the Jew Justice for Palestine and, and, and all that. He, he came from a perspective of social work and this, um, uh, uh, this is not quite on the revolutionary scale as we see, but definitely it's one of the leading steps towards the uh, revolution. These are the guys uh, that we should focus on. Uh, they see their, uh, what, they, we should, uh, what they taught and uh, maybe to implement. Okay. Okay, my turn, Judy? I think it's your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to uh, Judy and America State Israel for having us on this show. We're good friends and we, we bless Americans for State Israel and uh, we all pray together for um, 
Helen, your mother, to be strong and, and healthy. So uh, thanks again, Judy, for, yeah, for bringing us on this uh, show. And shalom, everyone. It's always interesting to sit in my office in Ariel, right? I personally live in Ital and talk to people now from all around the world or primarily from America, and we can talk about issues. So this is uh, one, thing, one good thing that happened in, in the, you know, the last few months that we, we have these conversations and they're much, much more easier to conduct, right? So I'm happy for this opportunity. Uh, so thank you, Ron, for uh, introducing um, uh, the, uh, the forefathers of propaganda. Um, so I think I'll take it from there, actually. Um, so who, who's running the show today? Right, that's the question. So, according to what um, Dr. Ron said, it actually is all belongs to the left side, right? To the Marxists. They started this whole worldview of propaganda, and and the big question for us, first of all, to ask is: Do we want to be part of a propaganda? Because uh, earlier on today, I asked Judy. If I'm born and bred Israeli, so I have different questions about English. I asked Judy if propaganda is usually used in a positive term or a negative one, and she sent me something from a dictionary that it usually means uh, um, playing it a bad game, playing a lie, right? Uh, playing with the, with a narrative in order to present something that you want to show, but it's not always true. So the big question is, first of all, it was a question I had to ask myself, do I really want to play in this propaganda game? Okay, I know who's leading it today, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but do I want to play in the same method? And, and this is something personal that I wish to share with you, which happened to me. I, as Judy said, a few years ago, I had a long beard and peot. I don't know how you call them in English. And, and I was sort of a hilltop youth, and, and I was very frustrated because I saw reality. It, it was... Actually, when I opened my first Facebook page, when uh, Judy mentioned that in 2014, it was actually 2015. It was only five years ago. And then I noticed that we're playing in a whole different ball game right now, and people are spreading so much lies and so much anti-Israel propaganda is going on. And I was expecting, I had expected that maybe someone will do something about it. I mean, we're, we're a very progressed country. We have you know, great high tech, we have great technology, we have you know, a great mind and, and, and a Jewish, um, I don't know, initiatives, but I noticed that nobody's actually taking action in this propaganda field, and it's completely uh, uh, maneuvered and, and, and um, b by the left. So this is one of the things that I had to make a decision Am I going to start playing in the field where I know that the masters of this field are people from the left? And that, that's still reality today. This is very important to understand when we're talking about propaganda, right? Who's leading the propaganda? Yes, today, the propaganda, as Ron said, belongs to people on the left. They're much more technical. Um, they, they have less of a problem in creating uh, uh, um, a different and biased and tilted reality, right? So, and for us, it, it's very difficult to enter this kind of field and to try to play with in, in this game. So I made a decision five years ago that I am going to start playing with it. I'm, I'm going to start, you know, there's a thing, if you can't beat him, join him. Um, but we don't like this thing, Israelis. Uh, we, we, we don't believe in giving up. So there's, I came up with a different version. If you want to beat him, join him. If you want to beat him, join him. If we have to play in this game. So I, I understood two things. That one, the people who are leading this game are the left. I, I don't know if that's the right term to call them, but progressive, progressive liberal. And the other is that we have to start playing in this field. So they have the advantage when it comes to propaganda, but our advantage, and this is something that 
is counter to the propaganda idea is the truth. We have the truth. The truth is, is reality. And, and it's different. It's impossible to ignore the truth and reality. And our problem is that we're dealing sometimes with people who do not have a problem of twisting this reality. So I want to show you the second video I've ever done, and it was actually a reply to Roger Cohen from the New York Times. He's a Jew. That's another one of our problems that we'll touch later on in this uh, Zoom meeting. But when I saw him stand in front of the crowd, an audience, and tell him and present to them that he has been to the West Bank and that he wants to share with them what he saw in the West Bank, and he completely lied about reality. He, he claimed that us settlers were driving in big highways with beautiful cars, and next to us are Palestinians with a, a donkey carts trying to reach their orchards. The, thi the only thing I did was take my mobile and I videoed the Arab um, adjacent uh, uh, neighborhood a village that we drive every day, and that was powerful enough to completely dismantle his life. So we'll put this video, if we have a, a two minutes, it's a one and a half minute video, and, and I'll wrap this up. Can we please? This is the wrong video. These big red... Uh, not this one? It's the first one, I, the, the last one I sent, wait. You know what, Esri, um, you've really gone over the five minutes this time on this question. Is there another question where the where the donkey cart video? Yes, might, no might problem. Okay, all right. Okay. So let me know. Let me know um, next time after I four minutes. I, like I, I was going to get a notification, but I'm going to time it from now on. Um, Great. It's interesting. At some point, I would really like to know what the difference is between propaganda and public relations, and I'm sure that. Oh, there's uh, none. That's very easy. That's very easy. There's no difference. Because, That's very uh, you know, they're always saying that the, the, the left is winning the PR war. Yeah. Um, but because they don't want to say that they, the, the left is winning the, the propaganda war. But it's the, the one and the same. Propaganda has a very bad PR uh, problem. But PR doesn't have a PR. I mean, PR has a PR problem. Uh, always because, you know, they, uh, they made their research on that and they said that the most associated word with uh, PR is a sleek, sleek PR person or sleek PR idea or something like that. So uh, propaganda, uh, even more so, has a very serious image problem, but it's there and it's not about lies, it's about s amounts of telling the truth. Goebbels was not the world's greatest liar um, uh, Lenin was, uh, and um, we should not, you know, we should not, uh, you know, uh, abhor uh, the concept of propaganda just because it has a bad name. We can call it a different name. We can call it Hasbara. What's the difference? Well, cynics would say that <laughs> cynics would say that uh, Hasbara is is bad propaganda, but uh, but the propaganda, nevertheless, uh, we should not shy away from it. We have to understand it. And it's not about lies because we all tell lies. Never, the world could not have not have uh, sustained if we all told 100% uh, of the truth um, every, every minute of our lives. At least uh, no marriage would have sustained that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Schleifer. Or Ron, I'm gonna call you Ron. Ron, Ron, yeah, Ron's fine, yeah. yeah. So basically, what are, the, what are the principles of propaganda that are being used against Israel and the Jewish people at this, at this point? Um, do you want to answer that, Ron? Do you want to start? No, no, you go, go ahead. For sure. Okay. So, um, of course, there are, are many different rules that could be applied. And um, I think instead of going over many, many rules, I think what's needed to be done, first of all, is for a person, the first rule is to do something, is to get up and do something about it. Because there are so many ways that we, everyone who's listening right now, can take action 
And if we know the platforms that are waiting for us and if we know how to use these platforms, so the first thing we need to do, everybody has a cell phone, right? Everybody has WhatsApp groups. Everybody has, everybody has a Facebook page. Everybody has email friends. These are, I think, the basic things that a person needs to do is that whatever he has, every method he could use, that he should imply that into acting. That, that's exactly what happened to me at the beginning when I told you I, I started with actually nothing, not knowing anything about propaganda. And I took the first step. And after taking the first step, I took another step and another step. And so I think the basic rule, if you ask me, is just to get up and do, because many people are seeing this whole propaganda war waged against Israel, and they're getting cold feet. And they're feeling... I'm afraid to speak out. People are afraid to speak out sometimes, and people are afraid to take action. And today, I got a message from someone who said, I know that we should be more vociferous about it. So I think in a propaganda, the louder you are, but it's not only about being loud, but the more um, strength and belief that you have and the more power that you have waving the flag of your belief, I think this is something that everybody should um, be more and more powerful about it. So, again, what I'm saying is the best thing a person should do is just to get up and start fighting in this war. Um, so the second... What, what, it, what you did is you got up and you got out on the street with your cell phone and you took that, that video that you were going to show us in the last episode. Would you like to show it now? Yes, please. Ladies, but video number three. Imagine Israelis in their fast cars, black bearing away, booming down these superhighways, while Palestinians on their donkey carts make their way on dirt tracks, if they can get there, to their orchards. So, Mr. Cohen. You're exploiting the fact that you're Jewish and that you were here in order to justify your disgusting lies. But you have no integrity. We are here in Khawara, a standard Palestinian village right under mine. And behind us, a dirt road used both by Jews and Arabs alike. Let's take a ride and look at some donkey carts. White and green license plate, Palestinian donkey cart, orange, Israeli one. This is a regular day, regular hour. No manipulation. Come. Okay, so we are in Khawala, Palestinian village. All the cars in front of us, white license plate and green, Palestinian cars. All Palestinian. Palestinians on their donkey cars. Oh, that's a beauty. All Palestinian cars. Palestinians on their donkey cars. This one's Israeli. Israelis in their fast cars. Israelis in their fast cars. Palestinian. Palestinians on that Hey, beautiful Audi. Palestinian. Israeli. Wow, that's a beautiful BMW, man. What I observed there on my visit to the West Bank amounts to a kind of trimmer in Columbia Oh, here's a Mercedes. That's nice. Imagine. Imagine. All Palestinian cars. Very nice. Colonia, there's a Oh, that's a nice Palestinian. Hey! Another Mercedes. Imagine Israelis in their fast cars, black bearing away, booming down these super highways while Palestinians on their donkey carts make their way on dirt tracks if they can get there to their orchards. Palestinians on this their is a carts. small example of how lies are spread against Israel, okay, that's, that's even good. by Jews. Most of these lies remain untackled. I've opened a Head Start crowdfunding project that, yeah. in order to make more of these and other videos. Great, so, so thank you for the opportunity. This was my second ever video and I I didn't even, it was the first video I edited with my mobile. It was completely the beginning of everything. 
And I took another step and another step and another step. And today, as you mentioned, today um, an Israeli guy from the village of Itar is standing and, and confronting the U.S. State Department and, and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has a letter from two congressmen asking him to change something that is happening here in Israel. So I myself am also looking at this whole process and saying, I would have never believed I would have gotten to this place, but I took the first step. And once the person takes the first step, the next step reveals to him. So I, I, again, let me wrap this up. Again, I think what we should do is take a step. And if you've taken one step, take another step. And if you've taken the second one, take the third one. There is so much to do. And unfortunately, we do not have enough players in this game. So first rule, get up, start doing, fight for the truth. Terrific. Ron? Yeah, okay. Could you put the slide with the, uh, the Ten Commandments? Actually, 15 grew to 15. But if you could, that will be uh, very helpful. Okay, the first, uh, the first point that I want to make is that, yeah, I made it a little bit uh, opaque uh, because um, this uh, session is going to be circulating. Uh, no doubt in maybe in other uh, circles that are less preferable to uh, to the presence of jo those uh, who registered. Uh, okay, first of all, you have to understand that propag uh, propaganda is a profession. Uh, propaganda is a profession and therefore professionals don't get mad, they don't get emotional, they don't get upset. It's a business. If you don't get upset, with uh, with in a transaction that you do in something that you buy or that you sell, you have to be rational and you have to evaluate it uh, rationally and act accordingly. Okay, now let's go to uh, number one. Number one, power is uh, is binary. What I meant by that is uh, is according to Lenin, you cannot win by being nice. You cannot win by being nice. If you want to win, you have to win, you have to want it, and you have to act accordingly. And uh, you're either in power or you're not. There's no some, somewhere in, in between. Now, the problem with the um, activists for Israel, or say our kind of activists for Israel, is uh, they don't realize that propaganda is not the, uh, the aim, it, it's the means to get to the aim. Now we have to start uh, sitting, uh, you know, uh, till the end of eternity to decide what is our goal, what is our uh, aim. And this is why pro-Israeli propaganda doesn't work. Uh, and it's general, it's also for, for the US and it's also for the whole Western world. Uh, the right, the, the right wing doesn't know what it wants. All it, all it does is to fight against the left wing. The left wing knows what they want. They want it's, they want a revolution. Now, what will be after the the, the revolution? They don't care. But they want a revolution. The so the current social system is uh, corrupt. It's not working. We have to destroy it. Uh, so they have it easy. Now we have to. We have to phrase what we want. We want to have a safe Israel. We want to have an Israel with safe borders, with a sound economy, with uh, good connections uh, worldwide, etc., etc. Now, anybody who is on, in our way, according to the uh, to the uh, Bolshevik uh, strategy, should be wiped out. Okay. So power is binary. Number two, inflate, inflate. Inflate your yourself. The Soviets, the uh, the rebel, the uh, the Bolsheviks were always a small group, very dedicated to the end, to the end, very dedicated, but they were always a small group. What they mastered is the art of appearing big and strong, which they were never wear, uh, and it took them a long time to be. Uh, the uh, all-powerful Soviet Union, but uh, before the revolution, during the revolution, and I, even five years after the revolution, they were very, very weak. But they managed to present themselves as something ominous, something strong, 
something much bigger than they really were. So this is why the pro-Israel activist, uh, the organization or the person always has uh, have to uh, outline how powerful they are. Number three, imitate. If you see a good technique, follow it. Follow it. Why not the copy? Why not? If it's, if it's done by the evil ones, why don't you do that? Okay. And number four, I said visual. And this, as we will agree with me, and he works uh, very nicely along this way, is uh, people don't read. They haven't been reading in the past 50 or 60 years, except for Jews. Um, and uh, visual is the key to, uh, to deliver a message. It's much better to do a short clip, a meme, a cartoon, a, uh, a poster, than an article. And five, uh, number five, I would say defend and attack. Always, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, okay. Defend and attack. Every time you approach an issue, of course, first of all, uh, it's um, you, you don't have the initiative. I would say go for first and be uh, and, and be the first one to attack. But normally this is not uh, the case. So I would uh, uh, recommend defend whenever you are attacked and immediately after you finish the defense, it's just the beginning for your attack on the enemy. Let him, let the enemy or your rival be on the defense. And um, yeah, future. Uh, so there are many, many points here. The, what the, the D, D and I is, stands for divide et impera, meaning divide and rule. Divide your enemies and set them against each other. This is what they're doing uh, with, uh, to us. This is how the J Street uh, was uh, set up, and this is why the Jews for Justice in Palestine is set up, and this is why Hila was taken over, etc., etc. Um, don't be negative. People don't like being negative. Don't just say, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not. Say what you want and give them a, uh, give them a vision, which connects to the other uh, uh, right uh, next to it, future. Show what the big future is going to be and how bad the future of your enemy is, uh, is uh, striving for. And last, is on the left hand side shame and irony there's nothing more than the left wing detests than being shamed and being ridiculed and this is the thought the teaching of sololinsky based on uh, based on the soviet doctrine they hate to be ridiculed they hate they 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 get they freak out and they go completely out of focus and out of function if you manage to ridicule them. So these are the basic, basic techniques. And of course, this is just a drop in the sea. The rest, sometime, some other time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the they and the us, but sometimes the they are us. So how can propaganda be used to deal with the progressive Jewish anti-Israel movement? I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Because uh, honestly, saying this is a question I asked Judy to insert because this is an issue that I want to address. Um, I'll let you in a secret that when uh, I wrote the text for the first uh, very, very powerful video I created, Imagine, uh, which was my first English video, and it reached over a million views within a few days. It was very, very powerful. The reason I wrote this Imagine, so it, it's like, it, 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 imagine yourself driving in your car, being targeted by rocks, missiles, imagine murders, being in a tunnel under your house. So the reason, the text was written actually to American Jews. Now, at the time, I did not know the big uh, divide between American Jews themselves, right? Um, I didn't know that, I, I thought, all of them, and most of them at the beginning, were pro-Israel because, you know, I'm, I was old schooled in that manner. But when I opened up my Facebook page and I noticed that there are some Jews who are 
bashing us over and over again and are so blind to what's happening here, I felt the need to write uh, a text. And, and that text turned into the first ever video. So this issue is very, very um, uh, important to me. It's very disappointing. I don't know exactly which uh, terms to use, but I think we cannot ignore this issue. And, and, it's, and it's a burning issue. And I wish to apologize if any one of the people here who is watching um, um, may be offended. Although, again, I'm, I'm not here to offend anyone. But just to say, what's important for me is to display to American Jews what we feel here. But, and it's very important. You know, we're talking about propaganda. When you want to talk about Israel, it's very, very important to also understand what Israelis feel from here. Um, and, and this is something that, that's a very, very um, hard question to answer. How do we treat those progressive, liberal Jews who turn their backs to us in all way possible? So it's not a question. It, for me, it's not only a question. It's something that has to do with my life. I mean, my, my security. Not only me, but the security of the whole state of Israel. We're not playing the game here. So this isn't an issue. Of course, if we have an argument, it's completely legitimate, right? If, if somebody thinks that we should not be here in Judea and Samaria and there should be another um, um, you know, two-state solution, it, it's still a legitimate claim. But when it comes to a person who completely ignores our side of the story and takes only one side, of the story, and he completely ignores, he closes his eyes to the, the, the scheme or the intentions of the other side. And when we try to shout, listen, they're saying from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Can't you understand it? Isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't this essential? Don't you understand that we are facing a very, very big threat from all this propaganda, this campaign? Can't you understand we're, we're facing a threat from Hezbollah in the north and from the Hamas from the south and from the, the Arabs that I live among them and, and they've been, uh, um, they grew up with hatred for Jews? And can't you understand that what you're talking about has to do with the security of me and my children? So this is not a game. This is not a game. And, and for me, there, there is a red line. So issues that have to do with General direction One of minute. the Jewish people. One minute. Issues that have to do with general things of the Jewish people, everybody's welcome to talk about it. It's an open discussion. But when it comes to the security of me and my children and my, my, my relatives and the, and the Jewish state, there's no playing with that. And if you take a one-sided uh, um, uh, approach, the side of our enemy, then you completely cut yourself from me. And in that respect, I don't even want to address you. I don't want to address you. I want to address the people who I could talk to. I want to address the people who can think about this reality, even though they don't agree with me, but they haven't taken a one-side uh, approach that is my enemy's side. So, again, I, I feel that in time, this will, what I'm saying right now will only increase more and more, unfortunately, and we will have to address them as part of the other camp in every, every way that is, comes out of it. I mean, out. Thanks, Esri. <clears throat> Ron? Okay. Uh, this is a tough question, especially for an Israeli. Uh, but maybe not so much because what we see on Balfour Street, uh, uh, etc. What uh, I would say, I, there's no clear-cut answer how to deal with the progressive. I would say there is a scale, just like on the uh, what we use in psychological warfare, the enmity scale. There is an opponent and there is a rival, and then the, the end is the enemy, uh, which uh, we uh, only way to deal is to kill. Uh, we don't want to get uh, together to see the progressive Jews as the enemy. Uh, progress, uh, first of all, Jews have been fighting since, their, uh, since Mount Sinai. 
uh, among have been fighting among themselves, and uh, that's uh, that's a realization we have to take uh, to take into consideration. The second uh, thing is we have to understand the uh, the problem they find themselves in because they believe so much uh, in uh, integration and uh, dropping out the, the Jewish uh, element. It's a, it's a question of Jewish identity. And then very cleverly, the Palestinians uh, drove a wedge between Israel, uh, between uh, the uh, support of Israel and the Jewish community. Uh, and uh, they strive or they managed to do the divide, the divide and rule. Uh, we don't want to fall into the trap they set, uh, they set us, uh, uh, they set up for us. So what I think we should put on the sort of a scale, and the top is George Soros, which is an, uh, which is uh, close, very close, uh, to the top uh, problem. And then, and, and the other side of the scale is your uh, next door neighbor, a Jewish neighbor, who uh, votes, uh, uh, who voted for Obama, and really, really believes, and he believes um, the things that he's been uh, sold to. And in the middle there, the uh, the Roger Cohens, uh, they are a problem. They cannot be persuaded. Your next door neighbor could be persuaded, or somehow sidelined but uh roger coins are way way above uh, above the change and they serve with distinction uh the interests uh, uh against israel now if you ask them and if you really uh, confront them they say that we work for israel and this is why propaganda is so dangerous they really really believe mo most of them that what they do, Jeremy Benami is not doing this for the money, or not merely just for the money. But he believes that he is saving Israel from itself. Now, he bought on it uh, from the time he was on campus, and uh, he uh, was injected with this uh, message by, uh, by the pro-Palestinian powers. And um, I've looked into that in the past. I've researched that. And uh, he's, a sam he's an example of tens of thousands of Jewish radicals uh, all in America and in Europe and around the world who now uh, are in power and they use their power to, uh, to work against Israel. Now the technique is, uh, is same again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Leninism. And um, this, is how you, this is how you do it politically. And you use the, the, the strategies of Sololinsky. One minute. And, and this is how it works. So I think the bottom line is to uh, make a scale of, uh, uh, but it cannot be one answer, one silver bullet for every, to persuade and every one of the uh, progressive Jews with one answer, one attitude. That would not work. But we have to differentiate it and win them over. But God forbid we should not go into an internecine and war because this is exactly where the Palestinians uh, and their Soviet mentors uh, are leading us to. And we don't want to be there. Uh, absolutely. We definitely don't want to be there. Um, the, the final question that I have for you is given all of these, these factors, um, how do you feel? Can Israel win the propaganda war or the PR war? That's we. Um, how would one? Sorry, what? Me? I should go on. Uh, look, uh, I always get asked this question. Why uh, Israel, who is brilliant, uh, uh, the Jewish people, uh, who are brilliant in so many things and so many fields, uh, uh, are so miserable when it comes to propaganda. I have a few answers for that. Let's start with the, the I, I wrote, uh, if anybody is interested, uh, if you have your time, you can look into my publications, which are extremely boring. 
because this is what academics work do. Um, so I would say um, the Jewish people has been apologetic since the first, since in the third century uh, BC. Uh, we apologize, uh, Josephus Flavius uh, apologized and, uh, and Moses Mendelssohn apologized. We apologize for, for being Jewish, that, that's a fact. Um, we in Israel, as a uh, liberal democracy, uh, hate uh, propaganda, which I call the Goebbels effect. And uh, we think propaganda is associated, we wrongly think that propaganda is associated with uh, dictatorships, with fascism, Nazism, etc. Which is not, we all do propaganda, we all engage in propaganda, democracies engage in propaganda. Um, and, but we, uh, we hate it, so we have to change, we have to find a different name for it. And the American army is still working hard, it changes the name of psychological warfare every, every, every other year. Um, and yeah, I don't know, there's a lot of things on, on that. Um, we have inbred optimism that think at the end uh, will be will be okay. So uh, let's not get into uh, to a fight about uh, our image. Uh, we've been uh, you know mistreated uh, throughout history. So in the end we'll win. So we don't want to get uh, to get into that. Um, in Israel, why Israel is not good in propaganda, there are some more, uh, some more cynical uh, explanations like the fact that we're founded, uh, we, Israel was founded as a socialist country and the socialists uh, as a kin uh, in doctrine to the communists realize how powerful propaganda uh, has been so they tried to keep the reins on propaganda under their, uh, under their cover, under their hat. And Ben-Gurion let Israel have television only in, a, only in the late 60s. And the argument that persuaded him was that the, Ar that the um, a, a Jews from Arab countries, the Moroccans and Iraqis, have uh, television antennas in their home and they will bite on Arab propaganda. Uh, so we have to uh, answer that in kind. Uh, Israel still hasn't uh, left the uh, stance, the socialist uh, doctrine when it comes to uh, communication, to media, free media. Uh, we're still very much uh, bound on that. So we are lagging behind uh, the Palestinians who from day one, I'm sorry, from 1968 after the PLO was reorganized, uh, they uh, have been working on propaganda and psychological war warfare ever since, and we have a lot to learn. And then, of course, all the other explanations, which all are true, like the social, the political rift in Israel, uh, that the fact that um, that uh, Israeli academia has been um, influenced uh, for over three or four decades. Um, but through European and American um, academia, etc. Uh, so we we took the we took the poisonous uh, fruit of the uh, psychological the propaganda oh, yeah. against us, and uh, this is why we don't deal with that. But basically, basically, the, the I think that the most true. Um, explanation why we don't uh, deal with propaganda is uh, because we don't, uh, is because of anti-Semitism. We don't really, deep in our hearts, uh, don't believe there is a, uh, there is a medicine for uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Therefore, uh, propaganda, there, since there's no remedy for uh, anti-Semitism, therefore there's uh, no way we could ever win the propaganda war. And in order not to finish in a, such a grim tone, I say, even though this has been my academic uh, uh, career for the past three decades, uh, so what? So we don't have good propaganda. So what? We are winning in our security. We are the richest country in the region. Uh, we have safe borders. We don't have any water problems. 
uh, we are exporting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Every, everything is good except for propaganda. The, I know this is very partial uh, because propaganda is important in, for the well-being of Israel and the Jewish communities worldwide. Uh, but uh, the message is uh, that uh, we're still doing pretty good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, for that upbeat uh, ending Sorry. talk. Uh, we all need it. We just need yeah. it. Esri, yeah. what can you do? Thank, thank you. Let me be the spoiler then. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me take it from where uh, Ron actually finished. So, yes, Israel has so many great advantages, and Israel is a great country, has a strong army, and a vibrant democracy, and so on. But... In 67, it took, it took us uh, six days to wipe out three fully armed armies with tanks, with planes, with everything. And today, it takes us sometimes rounds of 50 days against a terror organization with 30,000 soldiers, with, um, um, you know, uh, automatic rifles. And after rounds of 50 days, we, we still don't know who can upper hand. And why is that? What changed? The only thing that really changed is the propaganda world. So uh, on the other uh, measures, things that Ron talked about, we only, um, you know, we've only climbed up. Um, but when it comes to deterrence and to winning wars, we find Israel today much weaker than what it was in 67. Because again, we have so many enemies around us, but we cannot come with the upper hand. We cannot win in a battle with Hamas. So that's a very, very big question to be asked. Why? How is that? And the only real thing that changed is propaganda. Today, Israel does not have the legitimacy, the international legitimacy to fight for its security, to fight its wars. And this, this causes Israel, I mean, our enemies are smart. They tried winning us through battle with a regular army, and they failed. And if they try today, we'll, we'll most probably beat them at that. But when it comes to the legitimacy, legitimacy of starting your tank, the engine of your tank, that's where Israel has a problem. That's why sometimes... Uh, uh, um, murderers even, if people with knives and people who throw Molotov cocktails at us, they're perceived as, as freedom warriors. And the IDF who's protecting us is perceived as the worst um, human rights offender. And, and this is very dangerous. This is very, very dangerous. So this question for us, for me, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to display what, what we feel here in Israel especially me and, and where I live and the surrounding where I live, this question is critical for us. This question means if we're allowed to protect ourselves. This question means if Israel would, would be able to withstand uh, future wars if it will be attacked from all sides. That's why it is crucial to answer, yes, we have to win this propaganda war. That's my answer. That's what I wake up every morning. It's difficult. We talk about the difficulties that we're, we're facing, but we have to win this propaganda war. Why? Because eventually the truth will prevail, and we are waving with that, and, and we are waving with it, and we're trying to use all the things that we're learning from this whole propaganda thing, but to display the truth, and the truth will prevail, and that, this is what's happening here in Israel, and I know it's happening too in America. Progressive people who are taking it more and more the directions which are starting to become hallucinating, right? I mean, we're starting to look at them as you're completely disconnected. And people from the center are becoming more in Israel right-wing or conservative or whichever, or Zionist or pro-Israel. So this question is very, very dear to me. I wake up with it every morning. I go to sleep with it. And I know one answer. We have to win this war. It's not a side thing. The propaganda means the security and well-being of the state of Israel. That's the way I look at it. That is how I think people should, should do it as well. And I finished it in four minutes. 
instead of five. So yes, we're going to win for sure. Excellent, excellent. We have had so many questions from the audience and many of them are questions that are, are plaguing me. Um, one of them is, is just about kind of terminology. It seems that the Israeli leadership is still using words like Palestinian rather than Arab, like annexation rather than applying uh, Israeli law to Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. How can we teach the people within Israel, the leadership within Israel, to, to you know, speak the correct language? And thank you, Lorreen, for that question. Okay, who's answering? Should I go for it? Go for it. Okay. Um, this in uh, social science is called the framing, uh, and it's far worse than than it seems. Uh, it's also, not surprisingly, a Soviet technique. If you influence the language, you influence the thought, and if you influence the thought, you influence the deeds. Uh, so this is why uh, why they chose uh, a a uh, vocabulary of uh, basic words which they promoted their own way, of course, yeah? And one of them was democracy, the other side was freedom and peace, etc. These are all Soviet uh, elected words. Um, the, the campaign started about 40 years ago uh, to change the vocabulary. So this is why Judea and Samaria became the territories or, you know, on more part of uh, so the West Bank, um, it's I find much more uh, much more alarming the Israeli use of the term the tzaba, the army, instead of tzahal, the IDF. Um, um, the uh, the wars. Oh, that's a big big story. Uh, the the war of seventy three years ago. When I was a child, we used to call it Mirhemet Ashikhu, War of uh, Freedom, of Independence. Nowadays, it's called the 1948 War. So what's the difference? There's a, a, there's a world of difference. Um, it means that, uh, that it's a war just like any, any other war. And of course, the uh, 1967 uh, war uh, is a continuation. And the best, uh, the biggest uh, uh, Palestinian framing success is the Intifada, of course. <coughs> the Egyptians worked very hard to change the Yom Kippur War, which is a Jewish um, a concept, into the October War of 1973. In Arabic, it's the Ramadan War. That doesn't matter right now. But, in, but if you uh, want to write about Israeli history, you write about the 1973 war, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, uh, it's an ongoing campaign. It's uh, it, it, it's taking for already five decades. Now there's no other similar campaign that takes so long. The Cold War lasted uh, lasted uh, uh, less than than this uh, this campaign. So. Uh, you have to uh, the way to uh, to heal this uh, this malady is uh, um, to grow a new generation of writers, of journalists, of academics, and from there would we'll educate the politicians and uh, the other uh, influentials. Thank yep. you. Um, you brought up a new generation of journalists and politicians. Um, we in the States have this, uh, I don't know what I would call him, but uh, Joseph Flaschner has asked, how would you undo the damage that Peter Beinart has recently done with his latest article? And for those of you who don't know what that article was about, it was about uh, uh, asking for and, and suggesting that it would be appropriate for Israel to be a one state non-Jewish state for all people, but take away the Jewish part and just have a state. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a lot of what we're dealing with in the United States. Um, how would you in Israel handle this kind of thing? And what, how much damage do you think 
he would do oh. what he did, and what, how could we undo it? Enormous damage, enormous damage. Um, and it was to be expected because this is the next uh, stage that uh, that would happen. Um, the way to uh, to uh, deal with that is to ridicule uh, and uh, Beinart and uh, and give him an entry card to the extreme uh, right wing uh, faction of uh, Jewish politics and label him as a Kahana follower who wanted the same thing. Right, only only uh, one uh, one state uh, for for the Jews. He would definitely hate the the concept, uh, but there's no way of intellectualizing this because this is what he believes in. That it was, uh, and if you watch Beinart uh, from his early career uh, to this day, you see uh, you see a pattern, and this is uh, it's uh, for many Jewish uh, uh, progressive intellectuals. Who uh, who really find themselves in in a in a really miserable situation, right? Because they're being accused of uh, being associated uh, with the oppressors and um, and uh, colonialists, etc. So this is the way how they uh, they think they will be uh, uh, be out of the trap. So put them together with uh, with Thomas Friedman, who uh, hardly ever, uh, whose uh, one of his predictions hardly ever um, came true, uh, who uh, consistently uh, misrepresented the reality. But you have to realize that uh, Friedman was trained by the British in St. Anthony's College in Oxford when they when they uh, spotted him. A uh, young American Zionist uh, volunteer in a kibbutz and Hebrew speaker. Um, so they brought him into Oxford uh, to St. Anthony's. This is where the uh, the British uh, Circuit Service uh, is training their uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, specialist, and they converted him. And it was that's not a, such a big thing. When you are a 25-year-old uh, junior, um, junior uh, or uh, at your ma doing your masters, and then after 20 years, the guy turns to be the uh, uh, groomed, or turns out to be the leading uh, leading writer for the for the New York Times. Uh, so it's a three-decade effort. So it's not uh, if we want. Uh, uh, I said for, uh, earlier, imitate. This is the procedure that we should be taking. There's no way of now writing against Beinart and uh, expect something to happen. Uh, that, won't, that won't work. I think uh, Beinart uh, uh, did us uh, some good, in my opinion. I don't, again, I don't know how it looks from the American side, but Beinart exactly proves my case that um, some people progressive Jews who chose to be more progressive than Jews and who are going in that direction are becoming uh, completely disconnected from reality, uh, completely disconnected from the safety of Jews in Israel, and are more talking to find favor in the eyes of um, their friends in business or whatever in, in college than they're trying to really find a solution nor for Arabs, nor for Jews. So in my opinion, when I hear Beinart saying such a thing, I, I, I'm sorry in my heart that we have reached such a, such a stage. Of course, I do not want the separation between Jews, and I do not want to give our enemies uh, this present, but I, I'm not the one who made the choice to cut himself off. So when I hear people like Beinart, it's an opportunity to, to say to my friends and explain, explain to them that some of our brother Jews have completely disconnected themselves from uh, um, taking any notice of us or any care of us specifically. And in the name of whatever reasons they're doing it, they've, they're, they're willing to put us in grave danger. And it's grave danger. And I am not going to find any excuse for him. I'm not going to try to find explanations why he's doing so. He's a big guy. He's probably maybe even smarter than me, but something else is motivating him. And it's his choice. 
I would love, and this is what I teach my children, right? So first of all, if somebody wants to hurt you, you he's, he's away from you. He's not your friend. But you always keep an open place in your heart that if somebody does want to say, hey, listen, I'm sorry. I, I've made a mistake. I was mistaken. I was completely, uh, ex- um, didn't see you at all, and, and I want to start having a dialogue or a conversation, then I'm always open for that. But as long as a person decides to take himself to a, a path where he endangers me and my family, then I'm happy. He's at least saying it out loud. I'm happy that the truth, again, I've, I've talked about truth, and I believe that, that the truth should be always said. And, and finally, Beinart is saying what he probably believed in for a long time, and if you ask me in a few years from now, it'll become worse. And as long as they don't repent for this kind of behavior and this kind of attitude towards their brother Jews here in Israel, then I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm left without any choice but to prove that he has completely disconnected from us. And, and I thank him for at least showing and presenting it. I, I see where you're coming from. And yes, yeah, so it, it's, it's good when your enemy exposes himself or herself so that you, you know what you're dealing with. Um, I have to thank you so much for, uh, for, for working with us and, and coming and speaking to us. And I think this could have been a two hour webinar or a three hour webinar because there's so much to talk about. Um, you know, we just got a question in about what would you do about SJP um, and the and the students' use of SJP Week. Um, there are many, many questions to be asked, but we have reached. It's it's now uh, 2:08 in in New York, and so we're eight minutes over our hour. And I want to respect people's time, and I I thank everybody for joining us. Um, Thank you very much. I'd like to tell people, unmute everybody so they can say hello to each other. And anybody who would like to, <laughs> anybody who would like to uh, send in questions, Judy at Edward.org, I will make sure the questions get to our speakers. And perhaps we we'll need to convince them to speak with us again. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Judy. Hi, Judy. How are you? Hi, Judy. It's nice to see you. Say hello to your mom. Thank you. I will. 